it's definitely you. Namo tassa bhagavato rahato samma sambhutasa namo tassa bhagavato rahato samma sambhutasa namo tassa bhagavato rahato samma sambhutasa buddhang dhammang sangang namasami So we're in an occasion, we have an occasion, and uh, occasion is something to not rush past, but to dwell in, mm. till, it, till the wave of it, till the potentials in it, till the fullness of it, till the meaning of it rises and takes us forward. Mm. Occasions are really not about, they're not clock time, they're heart time. At times when we touch into something that's potent, meaningful, tragic, wonderful, profound, horrible. <laughs> and you let the wave of it pick you up, and you, you know, find your parami and move with it. So this is actually a very uh, fortunate occasion. Uh, it's the occasion of the certain quality of fruition. Yeah. This occasion has not just been today, but it's been the wave been, has been rising for many years, and it's picked up a, a strong potential the last uh, few months. The possibility where Vipassana feels it's got enough momentum in it to him to step back, a very beautiful sign. Some of such uh, experience feels, yeah, I can step back. He's not a person who wavers or flinches from duty, so there's a feeling of, yes, it's ripe, it can move on. Mm. And certainly this occasion marked by this sense of this uh, wonderful um, facilities being opened up here so more people can come in and take shelter, refuge, feel comfortable, feel space, listen to the Dhamma, meet each other. Many, many wonderful possibilities in this place, you know, for children, for people to come, meet each other, listen to talks and so forth. And so the fullness of that, I think we should dwell in that. And, yeah. and the occasion, so really this is, to me, Elonpo Passano kind of more or less said it this morning already, and I don't want to move past that, what he was pointing to, because I think it's something we should dwell upon and take in very fully and really get the meaning of it. And to me, this, uh, this came up more or less as I, as I arri- arrived here, and the word that started to come into my mind was lineage. Lineage. Transmission, lineage. Mm-hmm. Mm, it's an interesting word. Mm. Taproot. And I came around and... Uh, looking around the buildings and then with Ajahn Krunadhamma and we saw this tree that had been growing outside the, uh, the main building. And when I'd been here a few years earlier, when the place had been so sketched out, we were looking at this tree and thinking that tree might have to, you know, the engineers feel it could be, you know, possibly dangerous for their foundations, you know, it might have to cut it down. I think, oh dear. Uh, you know, I came round, haven't cut it down. Oh. 
this is good. Yeah, and uh, the same thing happened when at Chittavivaka we had a, a tree, not anywhere near as big as that, but it was a small tree, but a very slow growing old tree. It was growing where we wanted to put a, a, a roof over a, a walkway. And they wanted to cut it down because it was getting in the way. Huh? No. No. That got here before us. <laughs> That's an elder. <laughs> you know, you don't cut them down. <laughs> it's an elder. <laughs> they know all kinds of things that we don't know. <laughs> it's got deep roots. It knows how to grow. It, uh, it, you know, it's doing good for the atmosphere. It's, it's beautiful. Don't cut it down. So we built the roof around it. Yeah. <laughs> kind of cut a big notch in the roof so the tree could grow up through the roof. Yeah, that's the way you work. And the Vaigiri, of course, is a branch of a, of a great tree. And uh, it's beautiful to see that uh, great tree uh, has the, the roots that transfer into new soil. The root hairs grow down, spread out, reach across the planet, reach across time, get embedded, great tree keeps growing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is also this occasion, <coughs> sense of tap root. Mm -hmm. And to dwell in it, yeah, because we all all have, we've all heard Dhamma, uh, we've got some understanding of it, and it's important to keep returning to that fundamental root that we have uh, towards truth, towards integrity, yeah, towards faith, towards discernment, and just keep staying with that and poking it down into the ground. If you know, the root has fine root hairs, very sensitive, and it can probe, and as it grows, the root becomes very strong up near the, and that, that can support the tree. When you've got a strong root, it's both got this immense supportive structure that can hold the tree up when the winds blow, and also got a sensitive, you know, growing tip that can probe down inquire, find nourishment and support the tree. So it both feeds and strengthens, feeds and strengthens. It's gentle, it's sensitive, it's also firm. And this is a really good thing to bear in mind in terms of your Dhamma practice. It's got to have those qualities to it, that inquiry, that probing in, and that willingness to enter soil, yeah, keep going. Yeah. And, of course, we live in the soil of our lives, don't we? So, in some ways, the occasion is also this, you know? The occasion is an occasion where we notice, you know, bushfires sweeping across the planet. We notice escalating crises. We notice domineering attitudes. We notice bullying tactics. We notice violence. We notice... a wave of this escalating quality of domination and brutality sweeping across our environment. That's also the occasion. This is why we have to dig deep. We have to go deep. This sense of the occasion challenges our normal understanding of time, which we think is clocks and tomorrow and so forth. But really, uh, to bear in mind that the heart-mind doesn't move in terms of time. Yeah. Clock time is a structure, creation. Heart-mind, the citta, doesn't do that. That's why you can still be with problems you had 20 years ago. <laughs> It, they don't, it doesn't move, it doesn't change just by letting the, the, the clock tick. <laughs> Jitta moves in terms of kama, in terms of acquisitions, in terms of its obstacles, and in terms of its push towards liberation. That's the only way it moves. <laughs> yeah, it moves across that territory. And for that we have to 
you know, really translate our apparent circumstances of, you know, name and identity and town and job and so forth into real, real, real qualities such as this is my uncertainty, this is my struggle, this is my friendships, this is my clarity, these are my, you know, this is where I'm getting stuck, these are my stuck patterns and habits. Translate into that, then you know what you're really in. <laughs> yeah. You're in the territory of your of one's uh, acquired habits, phobias, addictions, and also in the acquisition of one's barami, one's blessings and strengths. And in an occasion like this, we have a big chance to tap into the quality of the barami, the perfections, the virtues, the strengths, the transmission of Dhamma. So this is a great day for us, really. And may the day be long, and may it last long in your hearts. Maybe something you can return to many times. Look around, feel the friendship, the safety, the spaciousness, the welcome, the clarity, the simplicity, the straightforwardness of it. Yeah. Take a good look. Stay with it. Take it with you. Yeah. Because this movement in time is a real obstacle for people. I just, you know, particularly when one comes out of a pokey little country like Britain where we fuddle, befuddle and fluster a lot and sort of don't deal with things directly, we fumble, we look, we look slightly embarrassed and so forth. <laughs> Just you come to America and it's very different. It's very direct. And it's kind of in your face. It's also very driven. Just, wow, these things are really driven along here. It's a very driven and driving kind of culture. It really drives, you know. Uh, you look at British streets, they kind of wind and bend. And <laughs> American streets go straight. <laughs> Cut through the hill. <laughs> go straight. <laughs> I think this is why you have problems. <laughs> You don't notice the landscape. <laughs> You're always looking at the horizon. <laughs> I gave a talk in White Salmon the other day, and they're talking about you know detachment and getting some space around things, some calm, and so forth, and you know, and dealing with feeling safe, and you know, uh, just opening the heart a little bit. So after the talk, a uh, woman caught me and said, well, what, what do you do next? I said, well, you just keep working with that. You know, and you, wherever you feel some suffering, you start challenging that. What next? I said, well, you do that, and then, and then you just keep practicing with that. What about what next? I said, well, <laughs> you know, you just got to... So I thought, look, get, look, look you've got to get through greed, hatred, and delusion. Yeah, and what next? <laughs> What do you call that? I said, well, we kind of call it Nibbana. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, then, and then what? What next after that? <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> it's like you haven't even got your boots on yet and you're already <laughs> heading, you know, for the horizon. This is a mindset, isn't it? So we were pause. I said, you know, I think you're tr- trying to understand everything and just work with where you are. She goes, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, okay. <laughs> so to linger, you know, to learn to linger. And this is the, uh, you know, the potential which you, you begin to trust. It's not a stupefying lingering. Uh, uh, I've decided to kind of call this wilderness training. Because of course the uh, Sangha is a uh, forest Sangha. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we live in buildings. But essentially, I'd like to 
keep re- recollecting, reminding myself, reminding others, even though we live in buildings, yeah, we have a vehicle, we have organization and so forth, yeah, we have all that stuff. Still, our training is to live in the wilderness. Not because it, because it makes you smart. It makes you agile. You don't take things for granted. You don't rush forward. You don't dither. You don't freeze. You stay awake. And nothing is exactly certain. And nothing, there's no strategies. Yeah. There's no straight roads. It's all curve and bend and find your own way. And it's stay alert. Yeah? And for this, there's a particular kind of attention that is primary and necessary. You have to disengage from rushing forward, panicking, uh, complaining, worrying. You've got to disengage from these mental habits. You're alert. Disengage from sights and sounds. Not to disregard them, but just to not react to them. And this disengagement you find, strange enough, is this quiet centre, which I'm sure you've all you know, recognised and realised. There's a quiet centre that's awake, alert, attentive. It's not called knowing, called number of things. You, know, you disengage from that. And within that, you can start sounding the question, what's important now? What's fruitful now? Where's the wave now? And you, then you start looking around. You know, the wilderness training, you do that, and you look around, where are the birds going? Mm-hmm. Where's, how's the wind blowing? What are the clouds doing? Mm-hmm. And you, okay, it looks like that's the way. <laughs> you know, and it, that's what you do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when we train with this understanding, you know, uh, it means you, you come out of that rushing to what's next and you wait for guidance to direct you. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah. And there are several ways of, of disengagement, I think are very important to cultivate. <gasps> Disengagement is viveka. And it's sometimes um, structured or talked about in three particular ways kaya viveka, jitta viveka, and upadi viveka. And simply, kaya viveka is to do with body, jitta viveka is to do with the uh, mind, or, and upadi viveka is to do with sense of self, really, or the, what are called the aggregates. And Kaiviveka often seen to be, well, just get out of the town. Mm. You remove your body, get your body out of that, out of, out of, off of Main Street. Yeah. And when you, clearly in the time of the Buddha, you could just basically, you could walk out of the village in two miles, you're out there in, in the wilderness. I think to take it more deeply, it means just really get yourself out of the mainstream. Which means you're not jumping into the next, you know, the rhythms, the the rush, the consuming, the media saturation, the push-button internet access. You're not rushing down those kind of avenues which, which offer you so much possibility to rush down them and be captured. Yeah? You're not rushing down the street, you're not rushing into the, cons- into the stores, you're not rushing into you know, where the media is pushing you. You, you. you recognize those pushes, those seductions, those kind of, those promptings, and you pull back, because I don't trust it. Yeah? And so just cultivating this, like you can cultivate this when you're walking down, even when you're walking down the street in a town, if these towns still have streets in them, because some towns don't even have streets, they don't even, don't even have sidewalks, it's just all driven cars. <laughs> but if you've got a sidewalk, <laughs> you know what I mean. You walk down a sidewalk in a, in a city and there's lights playing, go, 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 go. 
and there's things mm-hmm. bye 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 bye, and there's things that saying you know stop you know hurry up hurry up hurry up get to stay in your body, walk your walk, take your time, find your don't lose your center, and you cultivate that in uh, in those respects. You cultivate that in breaking the habits. I mean, they're fairly uh, almost built-in habits in our physical environment. So you don't really have to go into the forest to, to do that, but it's certainly helpful to do so. The important thing is to get your, your body rhythms out of that driven, rushing, instant, hurry up, get there, zoom, mode. <laughs> You know, it's your nervous system. You've got to disengage. <laughs> and if you can do that for like uh, half an hour, ten minutes, five minutes, you know. I got it down to um, uh, uh, ten seconds. Asking people to do ten seconds. I wrote a little book about taking ten second breaks. So we said, oh, that's great. If only I could get time to read that book. I keep it in my... <laughs> I love the title of it. I'm keeping my office drawn. One, I really love the title of it. It hasn't actually got round to opening it because I'm too busy right now. <laughs> it says, take 10 seconds. That's a great idea. Yeah, I really do. I think I'll do that tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just that, that nerv- the nervous system. You can realize you're neurologically wired into this compulsiveness. Once you start to see that, how it's eaten into you, you know, how, it's, how we, we've been steeped with that, and it's eaten into us, as this is the most beneficial, profitable way to operate. Uh, panic. <laughs> <laughs> Grab, compulsion. Once you've seen that, and you, uh, hey, whatever you do, whatever you do, don't do that, you know. Because when you're in these things, you don't know the alternative, because you're in it. Yeah. See, at that moment, you don't know what, but you know this is feeling bad. Just disengage. Trust that. Yeah. Trust that disengagement. This is the avenue for the Dhamma. It all begins with that, really. And Jitavivaka re- refers to the, uh, the patterns of the mind, the programs, the repetitive moods and uh, compulsions, hindrances that we find ourselves uh, caught in, uh, um, condoning uh, the worry, the doubt, the despair, the irritations, just uh, following them. You know, there's always some reason why we can feel that way. We can feel uncertain, inadequate, um, you know, irritated, lesser, intimidated, all these qualities, left out, resentful, jealous, all these things. <coughs> and just stop, disengage. And when you're in it, when you're in doubt, when you're in worry, when you're in anxiety, when you're in it, you do not see anything else, you're in it. You do not see confidence. You do not see clarity because you're in doubt. So you can't say, oh, give me... What, what you can do is know this quality is something you've got to disengage from. And disengagement means you're widening your mind, pausing, breathing out, finding your ground, taking your time. Don't follow this. Don't fight it, don't follow it. Open, soften, disengage from the rhythms and the chatter and the messages. There's a sense of what we call the witnessing, isn't it? But it's much more than just the seeing, it's also a feeling that, and a feeling to where do you find somewhere where it's not doing that. Yeah, it could be the space, it could be somewhere in your body, it could be the end of an out-breath. Where do you find some place within your field of mind that is not of that nature, not in the doubt, not in the worry? 
and you begin to sense with that tremendous um, realization is you're not your mind. At least you're not your conditioned mind. This is this is really important. And we train that. And this leads on to Pariviveka, which is the sense of disengagement from the whole sense of self, which is not one thing, but the uh, perceptions, that's the memories, the impressions. Uh, I'm this, I'm that, I'm not this, I'm not that, I couldn't be this, I'm never that, he's that, but I'm not, that stuff. And the reactions, the compulsive actions, when you start operating on that level. Mm -hmm. You you just know this is not worth following. That's the... Often the, the mode of practice is very much being able to recognize fundamentally what's suffering, what's unskillful, what's stressful, what doesn't lead you anywhere useful, and just disengaging from it. The first right effort is really to not follow that which is directly, you know, stressing. And that's the advice of the first sutta, this is what should not be followed. It's the advice of the four efforts, do not make an effort to not follow this. Yeah. So it's an undoing, a non-doing, because when you're in that pattern, you don't know what you should do. You may have an idea, but you can't, unless you disengage, you don't feel the real thing. Disengagement and then trust. That's the act of faith. Faith is the opening. Faith is the hinge and swings the door. And then you begin to see there's a possibility, a little bit of self-confidence, a little bit of reassurance is necessary. You know? And then just start making your way. That's the way it goes. So these are three very important developments or ways of talking about this fundamental property of viveka, disengagement. Mm. And from this is where we begin to get a sense of what's to be followed and what's not to be followed. Mm. And you you found the head of the trail, yeah? Make sure your boots are tied on. Start trucking off that way. (laughs) This is very much the... uh, training in uh, our lineage, our tradition, and this is the training, uh, even though we're now 21st century America, California and so forth, all these very, you know, seemingly uh, highly modern and contemporary terms, we're still training, we're carrying through here, the lineage, the transmission, carrying through here is we're, we're learning to work through the, in the wilderness. We're learning to trust the wilderness. We're learning to operate in the wilderness. We're keeping this going. And uh, this is the, the training that is encouraged by all the great uh, teachers in our lineage. And it's often in, not just encouraged as an idea, but, but set up. You know, it's structured in. Yeah. And the structuring in is, uh, it's, in the, it's in the line we call vinya. And so this sometimes is the piece that people don't really understand completely. You know, I think vinya really means just lots of rules of things you don't do. And that's part of it. But probably more of it, I would say, and more often encouraged and, and recommended and trained in is what you do do. Yeah. You do take on duties. You do pay respects. You do look after this. You do care for that. You do work with this. You do. You know. <laughs> and it's not a frantic doing, but it's a steady, this is, this is your definition. This is your what you begin to form yourself within. This is where you begin to disengage from your compulsive self. This is where you begin to actualize the Dhamma as a living quality.
quality that you carry in your own body, your own mind, your own way of conduct, the way you sit, the way you stand, the way you walk, the way you relate to requisites, the way you relate to people. So it becomes a living vehicle, uh, an embodied human vehicle that that then stands out as three-dimensional. You can talk to it (laughs) and and, and witness it and see it being modeled. It's giving you kind of messages uh, to your own body, your own emotions. You're, You're continually being given those messaging models or those modeling messages you know, you know, uh, that are going on. Mm-hmm. And this is really, uh, I, uh, I'm pretty sure, looking around here, this has been a major part of what's been taught, trained, where the root, the tap root of the Dhamma uh, has uh, established itself in this time place. Mm-hmm. Just you look around, you know, you see the behavior, you see the conduct. Uh, you know, that's, that's the right place. And you see the results. There's greenness, there's flowering, there's blossoming. And there's, there's life, there's a transmission. So our training in uh, a summer life is that sense of disengaging from the, you know, the compulsive... Neurotic, neur- neurotic patterns of our behaviors that come into our bodies, controlling, steadying, governing the body, moving steadily, calmly, one step at a time. Yeah. Correct ways of sitting, standing, uh, addressing people. And these can seem just like kind of fussy details, but they're not. They are tiny, tiny, you know. Details in building up like a dumber body, you could say. That's not self. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the fundamental, fundamental things, um, you're paying respects, for example, something that we do a lot of, and it becomes an important um, part of how one practices. And certainly for myself, this has been, you know, made me realize uh, many things about my personality. Like, oh, I don't want to bother him. You should pay respect, you know, it's good to pay respects to someone, I don't want to bother him. Why do you think you're bothering him? (laughs) Uh, I don't want to be a nuisance. Why do you think you're a nuisance? Um, Or, uh, you know... uh, uh, he doesn't have time for me. Why do you think that? Yeah. Um, oh, it's not really worth, not really necessary. What are you, what are you trying to escape from? <laughs> yeah. I, haven't got any, I haven't got any questions. Why do you have to have a question? <laughs> I don't need anything. Well, why do you have to need something? <laughs> you know, you start challenging these ways in which one has kind of learned to operate. You know, I go towards people who either want me or attracted to me or I'm attracted to them, you know, or I've got something important to deal with. No, no this is not about that. Yeah. And the feeling of intimidation, you know, this is the great being. Uh, I don't want to get in his way, I'm a nuisance. And you know, stop that. And you go and you just pay, pay your respects. Yeah. It's like you enter in that space of just I'm open, I'm listening, I'm attentive. Mm, And you listen, and you notice a few things. Mm. And this is a a very beautiful time, because when you enter that, particularly in this relational sense, very often when when that occasion happens, and the person looks around and says, I think you need to relax, you know. <laughs> Just simple things. Because you're in that very open state, you know, quite obvious things go very deeply because you've opened. You haven't rushed on. You haven't come with a set of strategies. You haven't got a set of demands. You haven't got a set of questions. You're just going open. <laughs> yeah? You're not frightened. Yeah. You're just open. And then because of that openness, you know, 
small teach seemingly small teachings in terms of intellectual content go straight to the heart because the heart is open to it. Now this is often the way of the uh, forest tradition. You know, be patient. Uh, very simple teaching. Things change. Very simple teaching. Don't get caught up with this, that and the other. Very simple teaching. When you go in with an open heart, it just touches those places in your chitta, in your mind state, in your personal mindset. As you open up, those words, those, those go right into the places in your personal mindset where you're, you're triggered and re- release it, release it. This is, this is an occasion, you know, where, and we all live with other people. You know, we, everybody lives with other people. Do we ever find an occasion where, just with other people, just, just open, rather than moving on? Mm-hmm. And deepening naturally occurs. There's a sense of respect. When there's respect, very naturally, some kind of affection or warmth happens by itself and things occur that are meaningful and potent this is a treasure to remember this is why we cultivate such ways we play we deal with our requisites with respect you know, clearly for a, a summoner living on arms food this is a great occasion because every day if you really notice it it's, it's driven home you're living on arms food you're living, you know, you can't guarantee. You, there are no guarantees. You're just living on what turned up. Get it, you know. And uh, so you live with that sense of whatever is received, it came, it, aro- it arose. I'm grateful for that. <laughs> and therefore you're open to the beauty of generosity. And this is something... and. and and being nourished. This is something, again, that I really think is very important for everyone to cultivate. Because, of course, it can seem like, well, I'm not living in arms food. I just go down to the store, you know, get a whole bunch of stuff, cook it up. Where do you think the food came from? Well, it came from, yeah, but where do they get it from? Well, a farmer, where did the farmer get it from? The earth, okay. Are you grateful to the earth? <laughs> Do you remember that? Do you just take what you need from the earth or do you squander it? You're living on alms food. <laughs> the earth is offering you food. Yeah. Do you live with respect for that? Do you feel blessed by that? Or do you think, ah, we had that yesterday, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I went along with, you know, it's <laughs> kind of... 15 different options, you think, oh, wow, you know. When you live in the wilderness, a handful of rice is good food because it, it arose in an open space. And, you know, the more that we make our lives convenient and comfortable and assured, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. But when they're convenient and comfortable and assured, you lose the blessing <laughs> When it's convenient and comfortable and assured, you lose the blessing. You lose the blessedness. You lose the gratitude. You lose the sense of the, the, the wonder of it all. Because it's all been plotted and strategized. And we even get to think we deserve it. You know, entitled to it. And, you know, where did that come from? So we relate to food, we relate to people, we relate to our robes. Your robe in some ways just, the the idea is a pretty modest piece of cloth. The idea is you can make it out of a rag dragged off a corpse. If you know anything more modest than that, please let me know. (laughs) You could say that is downright ultimate modest, I mean. Clearly, we don't, we don't, we, we've gone up a bit since then. But <laughs> the idea is still that is considered to be the standard when you, when you go forth as a summoner. That's, that's, that's what they tell you. Your standard is 
you know, whatever r- rice is given, you know, that's enough. If you've got a rag off a corpse, that's enough. <laughs> if you've got a, you know, enough shelter over your head to keep the rain off your knees, that's enough. <laughs> and if you've got a, a fermented urine for medicine, then you're all set up. <laughs> they put that in. <laughs> In, in, the, uh, in the going forth, the idea is that generally we get better than that. No, no lay person has offered, ever offered me fermented urine yet. <laughs> it might challenge me, but I hope I would at least pause and <laughs> consider their intentions. <laughs> because when you start at that's the bottom line, everything else is up, isn't it, from there? And still, the sense is, with the, even the robe is a rag, we wear it like this is the skin of the Buddha. This is the banner of the Arahants. You treat it like it's silk, or, you know, like it's special, like it's delicate. You look after it, you tiny little hole in it, you fix it. You put it, you carefully fold it in the evening, put it over your robe rail, and you make sure the robe rail doesn't have any dirt on it. You know, I'm sure this is the training here. You put your finger on, make sure the robe rail, no snags in the wood, you put the robe over the robe rail. You know, what? You know, rather than just throw your shirt on the floor. You know. <laughs> and what is it doing? It's saying live with this sense of disengage your compulsive who cares habits. Disengage the sense of taking anything for granted. <laughs> disengage that and then whatever you have, you treat it with respect. And Buddha, when he was advising Anuruddha on this, he said, then these rag robes will be just like the Banaras silk. Because they'll be blessed. Yeah. So, you know, it's the sense within that movement, you know, we're really learning to deal with pretty, very ordinary stuff. The stuff of the world. Yeah. Everybody's got clothes, requisites, you know, tons of it. Just dealing with that to transfer it from just being my belongings into being that which is looking after me. That which is, I, did, I came here naked, you know. I came here naked and vulnerable. I got something to wrap around me. Thank you, you know. And, and to consider where it came from and to make it that which is the easiest thing possible requires less destru- least destruction, least damage. Yeah. Uh, so living respectfully in the earth is just such an important teaching. And it's been held in, in this Dhamma discipline from <coughs> the time of the Buddha onwards. This is the, this is the lineage. It's this. There are things, duties that we do, and going for arms round is one of our duties. You know, arms, you know, particularly in a, in a country which, where the whole society is ready, open for it, you don't say, what's the weather like today? <laughs> you go. You don't say, do I feel like it? <laughs> you go. You don't say, do I, need to, do I need to do it? You go. It's your duty. You get up and you go. Because you walk this into the world. And it, it, you realize the potential for it. And this for me was, this itself was also a very enormous uh, uh, training. We, so uh, when I first took robes, going on Bindabad, arms round, it was a huge uh, uh, training, a huge stretch in many ways. Because, you know, there are, yeah, and you go through a town, and people are clearly not that wealthy. And it's early morning, it's like 5 a.m. or 6, 5, half past 5 in the morning. They're not, they're not that wealthy. And you don't know them, and you haven't done anything for them, and you haven't deserved anything, and they're not asking for anything back. You feel like, how do I do this? I feel awkward, you know, and you, 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 you put a spoonful of rice in your bowl, 
And they don't want you to say thank you. You're not supposed to say thank you. You keep your eyes downcast, see the right, and walk on. <laughs> and you, all your social gambits suddenly have been unplugged. Who deserves, who's worthy, um, please, thank you, uh, I need, I can't, sorry, I can't bother you, I don't want to disturb you, right? Well, that's unplugged. And you're just left in this, you know, there's generosity. <coughs> Generosity's coming in, you have to receive it. And bits of your hardened self skin start to melt away. And you feel yourself... Uh, strangely blessed, uncomfortably blessed. Uncomfortably blessed because, of course, I'm not worth it. I don't deserve it. I haven't done very well. My meditation is a disaster. My mind's impure. <laughs> and I don't have much merit. And it's kind of going on. And nobody, they don't care. They just. And this thing goes on in your head about you're not worth it, you don't deserve it, you don't want to bother people, and you shouldn't be in the way, and after all they're poor people, and am I scrounging off them like a lazy bum. <laughs> 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 you know, and they're just they're embarrassed, because British people have got the ability to be embarrassed at the drop of a hat. So you just, just see all that stuff crackling around, whirring around, and then just sit back and you... Yeah. I wish I could just go out and buy some food. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just too much for me, really. And it's supposed to be too much for me because it gradually wears me away. You know, it wears down those boundaries and my independence and my my what I'm good at and being worthwhile and being not worth wears those down. And, you know, that's, that's the main training. Giving talks. So I, I, I'd only been in robes six weeks. There's a teacher said, I, I could do this somewhere else. You go and give this talk. Um, I had to go and give a talk in a meditation class. Oh, God. I mean, I just about hardly afloat and just say something. Just say, you know, just say something. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so I, was, uh, I, I did my best. I did, a, you know, try to come up with something, kind of figured it out first of all, his strategy, his strategy, technique, system, and laid this thing out, which I'd heard him say, and thought, okay, got through that. And then, which was a meditation class, I had to go and stay in the local monastery. And uh, so they said, oh, no, Fra Farang, oh, Mr. Monk, you give a talk, you give a talk. <laughs> so we'll translate it. So, so they put this thing, I give a talk. So I started coming out with this, the nature of existence is so, no, 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 no. no. Uh, more simple, please. Um, okay. <laughs> when we're contemplating the four, no, 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 more simple, please. Thing. Okay, um, eventually, oh, meditation makes you feel good. Oh, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> <laughs> they say, why did you become a monk? Oh, because I was fed up. I was, <laughs> I was suffering so much. Oh, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> This idea you've got to come out with some incredibly complicated intellectual philosophical thing to <laughs> blow that out. Just, you know. <laughs> so that one, you know, coming to that. And I, and I, was, and I was now living with Ajahn Sumato for many years, and he had this deep end, deep end strategy. You just kind of suddenly you're doing something and push you into a deep end. <laughs> And one of these, I'd been, he'd been giving a series of talks at the Buddhist Society in London, and um, so it was my joy. I could go along. I'd go along as his attendant, and I'd put his sitting cloth down, and you know, and then I'd uh, make sure the water's ready and everything's okay, and he can sit there, and I'd just sit and listen to him talk. And he'd, he was giving a series of lectures, and I'd sit there. 
So we're going through this week after week. I was getting into quite a pleasant state with it. And I got down there with him one day and put the sitting cloth down. He got up on the seat. I was this thing. He said, Suchito, you give the talk. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, I don't think they're going to settle for meditation makes you feel good somehow. (laughs) So you just have that moment you pause. Breathe in, breathe out. Okay, here we go. Yeah. And so that's. Uh, yeah. So so many of these things. They the the theme is you get to this place. It's always pushing against your self boundaries, and there's a duty to do it. So you know, uh, it's not like just the vinya is always about not doing. It's about you have a duty, your teacher has asked you, therefore, whether you feel like you can do it, whether you want to do it, whether you feel you're worthy of doing it, you do it. <laughs> yeah. Or you try. You have a go, you know. <coughs> whether you think you're any good at it or not, you try. Because it's, that's, that's the sense of the momentum of what we're in. Yeah. That's what's going to send the tap root down, deeper and deeper. If you're waiting for your conditioned mind to tell you that you're worthy, that you're adequate, that you're good enough, you're going to be waiting until the cows come home. <laughs> you just do it. You just practice it. Yeah. And if, when you get to this point when, and after you've done it, your thing comes in telling you how you should have done it better, and you're not any good like that, you just... That's the next bit. Yes. Who's that? <coughs> you, you check that one. Just open. Here's the agitation. Here's the self coming back again. Go to the disengaged open space and let the ripples die down. Yeah. We'll see. Because we're in a lineage in which none of us have to be the one and only perfect who's got everything done, absolutely top, you know, unsurpassed. We don't have to do that. We all just throw our little bit in. It doesn't have to be the best or the greatest or the original or the new or the most profound. (laughs) You just keep the flow rolling on (laughs) and somebody will get something out of it for sure. (laughs) Because anything that comes straight from the heart goes straight to the heart and that's what we're doing. We're not really here to impart information. We're here to convey the transmission. And the transmission, the aim of the transmission is it goes into your heart, not just a series of thoughts. It touches you, and wakes you up, and reminds you of your potential. Yeah. Because this is the most important thing. You know? because the occasion is this on one level there's this lovely field of Dhamma blessings that we can touch into we can see the results of it the fruitions of it we can see people beings modelling it we can live in an environment where we're, we're sensing you know, the safety, the openness the gentleness, the respectfulness we can live in that Here we've got a chance to to really sense some of the fruit in, you know, human ways. Ways that just make us feel happier and better and more comfortable with each other and clearer and give us a sense of, yeah, there's something beautiful that arises in this world. That's the occasion. The occasion is also this, isn't it? We're in a world on fire with greed, hatred and delusion. You have to bring the two together. We can't do this alone. It's our responsibility. And every time, you know, whether you think you can do it, whether you think you can change things, whether you, how long it's going to take, whether it's all a waste of time, don't bother with that. Just do the good, refrain from doing the bad, put aside the anxiety. There's no time to be anxious. It's not an occasion to think of whether you're good enough for it. Just do it. (laughs) 
And this is, this is how it's going to grow. This is the way this has grown. You know, Bayagiri has grown. Uh, Chittaviveka has grown. Forest Sangha has grown. Not through having some great central organizational model saying, okay, send a platoon over there, a division over there, my strategy, you know, just through <laughs> touch into the good, where there's the invitation, where there's the invitation, people willing to support, <coughs> you go. Yeah, where there's the four requisites, the willingness <coughs> to support, is needed, you go. <laughs> and you, you work, and you, you know, that's, that's where it comes from. And gradually this thing can grow. So in, in and you see the results. Yesterday, just sitting in the dumb hall, very pleasant, you know, sitting there in the silence, in, in the refectory. Um, and you know, pleasant conversation, bits of humour, occasional questions. Same thing this morning, community just laughing, throwing a few ideas around, working things out. Just working things out, you know. Who knows how many people are going to turn up? Don't know. Who knows where you should put the cars? Don't know. Who knows how much food's going to turn up? Don't know. <laughs> Just, this is wilderness training. <laughs> yeah. And then just... So this is where we cultivate and one can begin to see and feel glad that there is this fruition. So this is our occasion. For me, it's an occasion to many things, but uh, uh, it's an occasion to be joyful. And we need the joy. We really need the joy. This is an occasion for it. Many beautiful things have occurred. Many people have found strength. Many people have found compassion. Many people have found they're bigger than they thought they were. Many people have reached out and found there are other people of a similar nature. Many people have found each other. Many people have found themselves. And may they continue to do so. This is an occasion for us to be rejoice and be joyful. So I offer this for your reflection. Mm-hmm.